Okay. Um, well, welcome back and good afternoon, everyone. Um, after the long summer break, um, I hope you all have had a good rest and, and are refreshed and, and full of energy to basically restart our series. Um, before we uh, start with this talk and before I start introducing our speaker for uh, today, let me just say that uh, we managed to convince Andrea uh, to join our um, to, to join the, the, the what, what, what was the uh, correct term, management board of the, of the seminar. Uh, so, or organizing committee. So we'll be even more organized than we were before now with Andrea on board. So thanks Andrea for, for helping us with that. Um, and it will also appear on the webpage very soon, which it doesn't yet, but, but we'll, we'll update that in a, in a, in a day or so. Um, so now uh, let's introduce the speaker. So I'm happy to uh, have um, Mario, Mario Alvarez Picalo here today. So um, this is a bit of a continuation of a theme that we had already a few times in, in this seminar. We talked about string diagrams and the use of string, string diagrams um, in, in, in quantum computing on the one hand, but also in sort of physics and, 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 and computational Mass um, on the other hand, so so uh, Mario will continue in that vein. I I assume uh, Mario has been a PhD student at Oxford until sort of two years ago, 2019, and is now at Huawei, as you can see here, um, doing things not unrelated to his talk today. So so this is not only interesting from a purely theoretical point of view, but apparently also interesting enough for Huawei to pay people to actually work on that on their behalf. So, so I'm curious to find out what exactly that involves. Please, Mario. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having me here. Um, before, before I start, uh, I think I, I would like to give a bit of, of context, um, especially on, on the topic of why, why Huawei is interested in these sort of topics and where this interest comes from. Um, so what I will be talking about today is how using string diagrams and more specifically hierarchical string diagrams um, can be very a very useful tool for formulating and reasoning about program transformations. Uh, automatic differentiation is a great example of this because it's a very, very complex program transformation, reverse mode, specifically reverse mode automatic differentiation uh, is a very complex um, program transformation. And uh, if, you, if you try to do it as an, as an AST to AST transformation, uh, it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, there, are, the, 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 there are lots of works that, that, that use this approach uh, and the have succeeded, uh, but we've found that empirically, in engineering terms, to actually implement that for a real programming language, it ends up being uh, a nightmare. Um, on one hand, the implementation is really hard, and on the other hand, proving soundness is really hard. And these are complex algorithms, so we we are very keen um, on, on, on knowing if, if not sound. Um, and what we found is that if we switched to a graph-based representation of a program uh, in the form of uh, hierarchical string diagrams, uh, which I will go over later, um, what we found is that these very complex algorithms suddenly became, uh, if not trivial, then certainly a lot simpler, um, a lot easier to implement, so that the engineering of this is actually um, I won't go into the engineering details, but the, the, this graph formalism turns out to make the nitty gritty of program rewriting much, much simpler. And not only that, it's also a lot easier to reason about them uh, equational. Um, and I will try to prove my point by showing a purely syntactic, if you will, uh, proof of soundness for one of the oldest. Um, in fact, I believe the oldest uh, reverse mode AD algorithm for functional languages. Um, so first, I would like to introduce reverse mode AD 
um, at least in 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 an uphill. Um, sorry, if I can if I can just ask the audience, can I get an idea of how many people here are familiar with automatic differentiation? Um, it's it's, no. it's fine if it, I, I will uh, because I, I've given a similar talk in, in contexts where just nobody was even aware of it, and I've given it in contexts where everyone was a world class expert. So it's it's good that I have an idea what to expect. Um, so uh, so I will give a, a a rough explanation of what reverse mode AD is. Um, so AD algorithms in general are a family of algorithms that are used to obtain derivatives of more or less arbitrary programs um, in a way that is far more efficient than symbolic differentiation. Um, you may know that symbolic differentiation usually leads to exponential blow up in code complexity. Um, and at the same time, automatic differentiation algorithms um, don't have the problem of numeric error that is introduced by numeric differentiation. So numeric differentiation is not really practical in, in, in any modern domain. For example, if you're working with something like a, a deep neural network, you simply cannot do uh, numeric uh, differentiation because the, the numeric errors that you accumulate end up being so vast as to make your results meaningless. So automatic differentiation, uh, which is usually divided into forward mode and reverse mode, um, we, today we will mostly talk about reverse mode. Um, essentially, the way it works is um, you give it a program as an input, and you get as an input a program that computes the same value as your orig original program, uh, plus um, the gradient of this program. And it does so, if you implement it correctly, it does so with only linear overhead um, over your original program. This is, in fact, extremely important. If you don't care about performance, uh, you could be just as well served by symbolic differentiation. So how does it accomplish this? Well, I can't really go into all of the details, but here's a small example. Uh, here we have uh, some very basic Python code that computes a, a polynomial. Uh, and I've, I've written it in, in SSA form because it's by far the simplest setting in which you can do it. If your program is in SSA uh, and it only has arithmetic, then reverse mode ED is very, very simple. Do is you take this program and you will transform it into a reverse version that has uh, the the same index. Sorry, for, for, for forget about this test. This is uh this is this should not be here. Um, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. So uh, forget about this test. This is a typo. Um, and so what this program does is, as you can see, it has what's called forward pass, um, which is, in this case, it, it's identical to the to your to the body of your original function, um, and then it has a reverse pass. And if you look at the if you look at the, what the reverse pass does, is intuitively what it's going to do is um, it is going to compute the the Partial derivative of. Apologies. Sorry, apologies. Uh, we we do get very bad audio quality. Could you could you maybe check your microphone? Sorry for the interruption. No, 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 no. Uh, actually, thanks for thanks for um, thanks for letting me know. Mm. Let me see if I can just. I'm going to get rid of my headsets, and that should that should actually improve the audio quality. Um, is is that any better? Yes, much better. Okay. Um, thank you. For for some reason, when I have my headset on, my computer at some point decides that it's going to start switching between the headset microphone and the laptop microphone, and it ends up being messed. Um, 
Okay, so as I was saying, the the reverse mode uh, transformation of of this simple function, um, this is usually what what this is usually called the adjoints of the original function. Um, it has a forward pass which roughly follows the structure on the control flow of the original function, uh, and then it has a reverse pass. Um, and what this reverse pass does is it will compute the partial derivative of the output of your function with respect to each of these intermediate values. Um, so in this case, st6 is the partial derivative of the output of the function with respect to the output of the function. Um, so it's just the identity. Um, st5 is the partial derivative of the output with respect to t5. Uh, and because the output is t5 plus 1, um, the, the partial derivative of that with respect to uh, t5 is just um, the partial derivative of the output with respect to itself uh, plus 0, because the partial derivative of anything with respect to the constant 1 is just 0, um, and so on. Um, so if you, if you think of your function as a big composition of f1 composed with f2, composed with f3, composed with f4, and so on, um, you, can, you can see that the, the derivative of this function um, can be obtained as a composition of the derivatives of f1, f2, and so on, uh, using the chain rule. And you can just that the, you can start associating these functions in one direction or the other. Um, you can you can compute derivatives by starting at either end of a function. You can start by computing the derivative of the output with respect to itself and then go back, uh, or you can start computing the derivative of the output with respect to x and then go forward. And this gives you um, respectively reverse mode AD and forward mode AD. Um, most everyone is interested in reverse mode AD because it's it's more efficient when you're interested in the gradients of a multivariate real valued function. Um, so if you have a function from R to the 25 into the reals, uh, reverse mode AD can compute the gradient of this function in just one pass, um, whereas forward mode AD um, needs 25 passes to compute each partial derivative for reasons that I won't go into. Uh, but the good use case for this is machine learning when you have a function with 3 million parameters into the reals and you want to optimize it by taking its gradient. So reverse mode AD is um, I'd say theoretically forward mode AD is a lot nicer. Uh, it's a much more elegant algorithm, but in practice, reverse mode AD is really what you want 99% of the time, which is why we study it. And also, it's much, much harder to do the program. I, I really cannot emphasize this enough. Um, can I ask you a quick ready? question? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Of course, of course, please do. So, 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 uh, so is it mainly the fact that you have many more inputs than you have outputs? Is that why it's not symmetric in the in the in the in the uh, sort of suitability of whether yes. you start? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so so in fact, it's it's kind of symmetric. Like if you if you have a function from the reals into a very large uh, output space, yeah, then yeah. forward mode is going to be a lot more efficient. Okay. Okay. Um, but you're basically going from the side that has less. Uh, 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 parameters into the side that has more parameters. So that's the uh, that's the point of the. Yeah, yeah. That's yes. I think that's that's one way to put it. Yes. Um, okay. okay. There's an interesting question here. Uh, this I'm getting a bit off topic, but since you mentioned it, this, uh, this is a, an extremely interesting question. Um, when I when I talk about AD and I said, well, you get forward mode and reverse mode by associating your functions differently. Um, when when you have n inputs and n outputs, um, there's a very very non-trivial theoretic question: what is the how to associate your chain of functions in order to get the most efficient way of computing the derivative? Mm -hmm. um, 
And this, I believe this has been proven to be an, an, an NP complete problem. Um, and I, I believe that because I don't, my complexity theory is very, very rudimentary. So I did that on the internet and uh, therefore it must be done. Um, it's a very interesting, it, it, it's a very interesting fact that reverse mode ADM and forward mode ADM are actually just poles of a spectrum uh, and if you want to get really, really sophisticated, um, you can try to associate your, your operations and get sort of like mixed mode uh, automatic differentiation, which is potentially a lot more efficient, but extremely hard to get right. Okay, okay. All right. So moving on, well, I think I've already sort of implicitly explained this, but the reason uh, reverse mobility is important is because you if you're doing machine learning, what you want to do is you want to run your program, you want to run your neural network using vectors and loops and mutable variables and whatever, whatever. And you don't want to have to think about what its derivative is. You just want to feed it into an AD system uh, and get a derivative out. Um, the corollary of this is that more powerful AD algorithms um, that can perform differentiation across more language features um, immediately reduce the 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 sort of the barrier of entry or the, the cost of developing machine learning systems. Um, the, the more features you support in automatic differentiation, the less machine learning engineers need to actually think about the code they're imagining, which is arguably a bad thing, but also a good thing. Um, ultimately the dream the dream is to do away with neural networks entirely and just tell people, write your program, write your program with a bunch of parameters. Whatever it is, we will be able to do gradient descent on it. Um, that's sort of the, the, the dream of differentiable programming. Um, it turns out that this is very hard because differentiating stuff like control flow and mutability and stuff like that uh, turns out to be really, really hard. Like, what is the derivative of an assignment? Um, questions like that stop making sense very quickly. So the algorithm for reverse mode AD that I'm present today um, is a relatively limited and primitive algorithm that appeared in, in TOGLAS uh, 2008. And it's, to my knowledge, the first reverse mode AD algorithm that was able to differentiate uh, code with higher order functions. And it, otherwise, it's a very, very restrictive um, context. Um, this, this was done for a pure functional language, for a pure dialect of Lisp or a dialect of scheme, in fact. Um, there are no side effects. There are no expressions that wouldn't be differentiable. There are no conditionals. It's a very, very primitive uh, language. Um, and uh, the contribution of that paper was to achieve correctness when differentiating terms containing higher orders of terms. Um, and the, some some that's not the only contribution of that paper. They also come up with this extremely clever uh, implementation of it by um, adding some really crazy runtime reflection capabilities uh, to their language. But I we will not go over that here um, because that's way beyond the scope of, of, of our formalism. Um, now, our contribution, I, I really want to emphasize, we didn't come up with this algorithm. Our contribution is a a formalization of this algorithm as a bunch of graph rewriting rules, which we think are a lot more readable and easier to implement. Soundness, which uh, this, when this algorithm was published, there was no soundness proof. And to the best of our knowledge of the literature, no soundness proof for this specific algorithm has appeared anywhere. Um, which is very interesting because, in fact, the algorithm is known to be on sound for certain cases, it's just that we happen to know what those cases are and they happen to not be important, as we will explain in detail. Um, so before I can explain our formalization of this algorithm, um, I, 
I want to give a, an extremely brief overview of the kind of string diagrams that we are uh, operating with. Uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I, I think they're fairly um, they're fairly intuitive. Um, so we have basically simple string diagrams with the with the the the, the sort of twist that they are higher on. So uh, whenever you have whenever you have a diagram, you can put it in in one of these rounded bubbles. Um, and basically, we interpret that as lambda something. So essentially, what we have is a graphical language for the simply type lambda calculus, um, and it it satisfies the equations that you would expect. Um, you can push um, you can push graphs through um, flipping wires. You can push graphs through um, through um, duplication. It all behaves exactly the way you would expect. Um, and of course, the, the, the bubbles, these bubbles themselves verify um, their, their functorial. So you can, you can push, um, you can push operations through them in the same way that you can do with land abstractions. Um, and you can apply them to a term. So this is this this unfortunately chosen piece of notation that looks a lot like an AND gate. Uh, this is not an AND gate. This is just how we denote the application. Um, so this is just taking this closure uh, and applying it to the to to, to this input wire. Uh, and what you get is essentially you pop the bubble, so to speak, uh, and you just keep the inside graph connected to the input wire. That's it's a really, really simple thing. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'm going to formulate the parameter Siskind algorithm in, in, in these hierarchical string diagrams. Um, it's it, We've uh, formalized it as a set of three graph uh, transformations, which we denote by differently colored boxes. Um, the, the colors have been chosen um, for being colorblind friendly, uh, but if you have problems distinguishing them, please let me know. Um, there's, there is a light blue box that takes a graph with some inputs B and some outputs B prime. Uh, and turns it into a graph with uh, the same input B uh, and one output, uh, sorry, this should be a B prime, uh, and output B prime, uh, and another output, um, again, this should be B prime into B. I was, I was pulling these slides for typos this morning and I found a bunch and I thought I was done, clearly not. Um, so the intuition for this, for this blue box, is it, press, it, it performs, broadly speaking, it performs the, the transformation that I've shown in this slide. So it takes uh, a primal graph and it turns it into a graph that has the same inputs and returns the same output as the original graph, except it also gives you the gradient of the graph at the same time. Uh, the, 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 the gradient in in the mathematical sense as a linear uh, function. It doesn't just return a number, it returns a linear equation. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a normal arrow, but it could very well be a linear implication because this function, this function will turn out to be linear. Uh, and so the way that this top level um, rule is implemented, is when you apply it to a graph, um, you rewrite that graph into a, so it's a forward pass and a reverse pass inside uh, one of these closure bubbles. Uh, so the way this works is the orange box uh, corresponds to the forward pass. This corresponds to this forward part of the upgrade transformation that I showed here. And the green one here, corresponds to the body of the reverse pass 
that you can see here. Uh, and just as in this toy example, the, the forward pass will not only generate an output, but also generate a bunch of intermediate inputs, sorry, intermediate results uh, that will be captured uh, by the reverse pass. So if you if you go back to this toy example, you can see that the the, the reverse pass, um, for example, uses um, uses some of the, the 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 variables that are defined in the forward pass. If, for example, uh, STY depends on T three, uh, which was produced by the forward pass. The, the real work of the algorithm is done by these orange and green boxes. Um, this is where the actually interesting stuff happens. Um, so we, we have some rules that I won't go into with much detail for the structural rules. Um, so for for duplication, this is this will be a common pattern that the the forward mode transformation of a graph is usually mostly the identity. Um, so the reverse mode transformation, for example, when intuitively I will I will explain these rules a little bit. Um, when you have some term that is used in two places in your program, uh, the derivative of your program with respect to that term is equal to the sum. Uh, of the derivatives of your program with respect to all of the places where it appears. That makes some sort of intuitive sense. But normally, normally, I can explain this by just saying that the, the gradient of the diagonal functor is the addition, but I don't think that's enlightening at all. Um, instead, a way, of, a way of thinking about this is I'm, I'm trying to compute how much each of the variable, each of the terms in my program contribute to the output. If the term appears twice, um, the contribution of that term to the output is the sum of the contributions of both um, places in which it's used. So that is how way the explanation. That's how this proof, so you have to believe it. Um, for for discarding, it's uh, it's it's quite similar. If you have a, an intuition, is basically the same. If you have a term in your program and you never use it, uh, then the derivative of the output with respect to that term is obviously zero because your term never actually is used when computing the output. Uh, for Constants and the identity, the story is pretty much the same, and everything is more or less as you would expect. Um, for primitive operations, so this, this language is parameterized over your set of primitive operations, which, you know, multiplication, addition, basic trigonometric primitives, what have you. Um, for, for these primitive operations, um, here we the, the the forward mode transformation starts to diverge slightly from just being the identity. Um, so as I said, the the forward mode transformation not only produces an input, it also produces a bunch of intermediate values that are captured by the reverse mode transformation. This is where we start to see it. Um, so here we see that the forward mode transformation on on some operation. Um, it performs the same operation as the original graph, uh, except it also um, copies the original inputs and uh, passes them to the reverse mode um, transformation. Uh, and what the reverse mode transformation will do is it will take um, it will take the, the partial derivative of the program with respect to the output of this operator, uh, and it will take the original values of the inputs. The operator in the forward pass, uh, and it passes them to some dual dual graph. Uh, and here, you have to ensure that for for every primitive operation that you include, um, you define corresponding dual graph, uh, which roughly corresponds to its gradient in the usual mathematical sense. Uh, 
um, so for example, for for the uh, for the addition. Um, you're getting these two wires here, which are the original values of the addition, uh, and the rightmost the rightmost wire is the the derivative of the program with respect to the addition of the two terms. Um, and what this says is ignore the original values of the inputs. Uh, the partial derivative of the program with respect to both things that I'm adding is just copying. Uh, the partial derivative of the program with respect to the addition. Um, because if you have x plus y, the partial derivative of this with respect to x is 1, and the partial derivative of this with respect to y is 1. Um, so all of these all of these rules come straight from very basic multivariate type. Um, uh, so let's get into the difficult part, the problematic part. I do believe I'm running out of time. Um, but if I can only explain these slides and then skim over the soundness proof, I will be a very happy man. Um, the real sort of interesting point of the Perlman Rasiskind algorithm, uh, because everything I've shown so far is completely trivial, uh, the real interesting part is how it handles um, abstraction and application. Um, for abstraction, the core pass does a very interesting thing. Um, for abstraction, the forward pass takes the, the lambda abstraction that you're producing, uh, and it, it applies the blue transformation to its inside. So if you started with an abstraction of type B1 into B2, if you started with a function from B1 to B2, uh, what you get is now a function from B1 into B2 and uh, B2 into B1 and B3. So essentially, uh, if you started with a primal function that just computes a value, uh, what you now get is a function that computes the same value plus the gradient of this function with respect to both its inputs uh, and its captured um, its captured variables, or its or its captured terms, and in the reverse pass, you do this very strange thing, which doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, you erase uh, the closure entirely. You the reverse pass behaves as if the closure didn't even exist. Um, and when you evaluate the function, when you when you have an evaluation mode um, for the forward pass. Um, what it will do is, so here comes the function from B1 into B2, um, and as we've, as we've seen, this type B1 into B2 will be transformed by the abstraction rule into something of type B1 into B2 times B2 into B1 times B3. So now, the, in the same way that the forward rule for abstraction turns every abstraction into its adjunct. Uh, the forward rule for application expects every term of function type to be turned into an adjunct. And so what it does is in the forward class, you, 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 you do the same application to the same input, except now what you get in the output is a product um, consisting of the original output and the gradient. The original output keeps going down the forward pass. Uh, but the gradient um, becomes captured by the reverse by the reverse pass. The reverse pass for this evaluation, um, what the, the input that you get here is the, the derivative of your program with respect to the result of the function application. Um, and you take this derivative and you pass it to the gradient that you captured from the forward pass. The output of this application will give you the functional derivative of your program with respect to both the input to your application and all of the variables that it captured. So once you do this application, now you have these functional derivatives and you simply plug them up 
the proper wires. Um, and I realized that this is immensely confusing, and, and it took us a very long time to understand how it works and why it works, and that it works at all. Um, and actually, this is part of the reason why we have to stop and write a, a, a soundness book, because this doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Um, if, if you're confused about this, depending on your background, you may find this helpful. Uh, think of this algorithm as doing closure conversion and then doing reverse mode AD on strictly the first order terms of your closure converted program and then doing closure conversion back. Um, this explanation helps me a lot. Um, so far, I found that it doesn't, it doesn't help anybody else, but I, I keep trying. Uh, so let's see. Let's see a, 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 a running example of this. Um, we start with this program, which is just a, a somewhat overcomplicated way of uh, computing x plus x squared. Um, and the rules one by one. First, we compute forward and reverse paths. Then the as you can see, the, 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 the topmost operator is an addition. So you apply the rule for an arithmetic operator. You can see that the, the inputs to the addition get captured by the back propagator, which in this case, it does any, it does nothing, uh, because that's how the dual graph for the addition works. Uh, then we keep going. We have an application. So we process the application. That said, the app, this application now expects the function to compute both the primal value and the gradient, and the gradient gets passed to the reverse path. And uh, at this point, we can choose whether to process the duplication or the abstraction first, and I don't remember which one I choose. Uh, abstraction is this. Um, so again, the abstraction turns this bubble into a bubble that now computes the outgoing of the original graph. So the same output together with the gradient. Um, and we just, all that remains is these um, contractions. So in the forward pass, they just become, become contractions, and in the reverse pass, they become additions. Um, and then all we need to do is process the output from this bubble, which I will do uh, actually. I, I, I will be a bit cheeky and save myself some effort and perform this application first. Um, now we can take the advent of this, and then what you get is that, and then it's just a matter of evaluating a bit. Uh, and eventually you get to this, which, you know, if you squint hard enough, you say that the same, the forward pass gives you the same output, and the reverse pass correctly computes the derivative of my original function, uh, which is 2x plus 1. Right. So with that in mind, I'm just going to start talking a bit about the main idea behind the soundness proof, and then I'll just stop and, and open the floor for questions. For, for I think first, remark that you know you, you have some nice structural properties, like confluence holds. Um, and confluence is kind of important because, you know, given a graph with many outputs, you you potentially you can apply these rewrite rules in more than one way. Um, especially because we actually have the, this specific algorithm is actually implemented in our industrial French AD system. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure that it doesn't depend on the order in which you apply it because concrete bugs would happen to us if it, if it did. Um, and it turns out that, of course, it, it doesn't. You can start rewriting either operator, and what you get is exactly the same modulo a permutation of the, the values that get propagated to the, to the reverse path, which really doesn't matter in practice. Um, these transformations from the forward mode or reverse mode, they're, they're not the forward mode one is functorial, um, and it, 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 so it, it satisfies this compositionality condition. Uh, the, the reverse pass satisfies this sort of reverse chain rule. And if you're at all familiar with 
those derivative categories, uh, this will look very familiar because, in, in fact, it is exactly the chain rule for reverse derivative categories. Um, and the proof of that is very, very trivial. You can you can do it by induction on the complexity of the graph, graph plus case analysis. This is simply one case. If you have a graph followed by an addition, you just apply the rule for addition. If you have a graph followed by addition, you apply the rule for addition, you apply the inductive hypothesis, you unapply the rule for addition, so that this top graph just becomes the reverse pass of G followed by plus, and you, you've just proven your reverse mode chain. I think I really want to emphasize just how easy and nice these sort of this sort of graphical reasoning is. Um, if you if you try to do this with terms, you're going to run into the very tricky problem that the way that you order them matters a lot. Uh, and your program is essentially a stack of lead bindings, and you need to think about in which order you define each thing and what values depend on what other values. Um, it's it's extremely intentional, so to speak, whereas we completely avoid all of those problems here, which I found very nice. Uh, lots of these proofs feel like lots of these proofs feel like I'm cheating. Um, this is another important property. This is actually the main property by the soundness proof. Uh, I call this beta compatibility. Uh, and this this says, well, my rules for abstraction and application are really weird. Uh, in fact, they seem to make no sense at all. Um, but if they are correct, then the, 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 these transformations should give me the same result before and after valuation. So to, to say this in, in a different way, if I start with a program with a bunch of beta redexes and apply my algorithm, I should get something that is identical to what I would get if I were to reduce all of these beta redexes ahead of time and then apply my ADR. You know, you, you start with a graph like this and you simply, you know, crank the level, so to speak. You go apply the rules one by one, step by step. Eventually you get to this. Uh, and now, as I said, the, these forward and reverse compositionality properties, you can apply them here and you can see that what you get, um, what you get is essentially, or is quite literally the same graph as starting here and applying these two beta reductions directly. And essentially, doing AD before or after beta reduction doesn't change your program. Because this is really the, 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 core, the core property of, of, of our assignments proof. Um, and sorry, how much time do I have left? Well, 15 minutes. Oh, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. Thank you. Um, so for the simplest proof, perhaps the, the hardest thing is to say exactly what soundness even means, because there is no such thing as, at least to the best of my knowledge, nobody, nobody has a good, easy to work with definition of the gradient of a higher order function. Um, it, you you can get quite close to it with with exponential linear logic, but it, it's 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 fairly hard if you if you start with a for, for for context and and to illustrate why forward mode is so much easier than reverse mode. Um, uh, the the sort of standard formalization for uh, derivatives in in a categorical setting is what's called Cartesian differential categories, which are categories equipped with a with a differential combinator that behaves like the derivative of calculus, um, and it's more or less trivial to extend those to the Cartesian closed case. 
it's more or less trivial to go from Cartesian differential categories to Cartesian closed differential categories, uh, which are called differential lambda categories. Um, for, for formalizing gradients, um, what we have is reverse derivative categories, which are simply a, a version of Cartesian differential categories where derivatives go in the opposite direction. Um, generalizing these to um, Cartesian closed reverse derivative categories is probably an open research question, and I don't expect any breakthroughs will be happening anytime soon. Um, not without bringing back something like linear logic into the mix. Um, so it's quite hard to find the setting to talk about higher order reverse mode AD because higher order gradients don't really exist in a way in a way that is is nice to deal with. Um, then that's perfectly fine because in fact our algorithm is not sound for terms with higher order inputs or outputs. The Commodore Siskind algorithm is only sound if you apply to terms that have only first order inputs and outputs. Uh, they can have higher order subterms, this is fine, but they cannot have um, higher order inputs or outputs. Um, so what we decided to do is to Restrict ourselves to the first order case. Um, also, what we what we prove is that if you take this AD transform and you apply it to a graph to to, to start a sort of first order graph, uh, although it may contain higher order subterms, um, this is the same as what you would get if you applied the reverse derivative combinator from a reverse derivative category to your graph. So we introduce this new pink box, which um, corresponds to the reverse the, the reverse differential combinator, um, which is a semantic notion. Um, this pink box is subject to these um, rules, which there are more equations that it satisfies, but the ones that we care about are these um these four and uh, the chain rule uh, and i won't i won't explain these in detail um because it would take an entire uh, one hour talk to go over those um if you're interested um you can um i, I will i will just let me know and i'll send you a link to the paper or just look for um reverse derivative categories and you'll you'll find it it's fairly recent um but basically, this, this pink box transformation gives you this, the proper semantic notion of gradient. Uh, this pink box transformation is not defined for abstraction and, and application because gradients are not defined for abstraction and application. Um, the the, the, the reverse, reverse differential combinators are not defined for abstraction or application. So the pink box is something that we can only apply to first order graphs and truly first order graphs. So graphs that don't contain any higher order subterms. Um, so what we're going to do, the, 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 the idea of our proof was to say, well, you start with a graph um, with only first order inputs and outputs. Um, you apply all of the beta redexes in this graph you 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 evaluate every single beta redex, and what you get after that is a purely first order graph. Then all we need to prove is that this purely first order graph, um, in for this first order graph, uh, the AD transform corresponds to the reverse derivative from addition uh, from from reverse essential categories. Um, so basically, what we prove is for, for strictly first order graphs, our AD transform corresponds to the mathematical gradients. 
start containing higher order subnets, um, you can, we are, you know, thanks to the to the beta compatibility theorem, we will really know that it doesn't matter that we evaluate all of these beta reduces. Doing AD before or after um, beta reducing these reduces will not will will result in programs that are um, equivalent. So we know that our initial program with higher order subterms. Um, AD on our initial program is equivalent to AD on a fully normalized program, which now no longer has any higher order subterms. So we only need to prove that for first order graphs, um, the AD transformation is equivalent to this pink box, which responds to the, 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 the it's, you can think of it as a, you can think of it as a rewrite rule version of the equations that are satisfied by the gradients from patterns. Uh, and doing this is very easy. I won't go through all of the details, but once once more, you can do you can prove it by uh, induction on the complexity of the graph. Here's a simple case with the. It's, it's actually one of the more complicated cases. Every other case is simpler. Um, for for um, infraction. You just start with this. You start evaluating it, this box with the rules for the for, for the gradient. So you apply the chain rule um, here. Essentially, what's happening is you have this graph composed with this graph. So you apply the chain rule um, to compute the gradient of that graph based on the gradients of these and these, uh, and then you just evaluate the gradient of this um, box here. And you evaluate it again, and what you get is this. Uh, and then this is simply, well, this is just a compaction, so you just put it away. Uh, what you get is this. Uh, and then you start folding it again by, by induction hypothesis. This gradient is equal to this AD transform. Uh, and then you can just fold, fold this back into here, uh, apply the on applying the the contractor rule for the reverse path, um, and this is uh, just um, thrown away. So we can as well insert this entire tree of things here uh, and push this back in for the contractor rule from. Um, um, yeah. You you need to do this for all of the all of the rules, but it really is. Just as trivial as this, if not more trivial, because as I said, you only need to do this for um, first order graphs. You don't need to handle uh, abstraction or evaluation. Um, and uh, that really is it. That's all there is to the the proof, of the soundness proof, which I think is. I've I've seen a bunch of soundness proofs for AD algorithms. Um, this is by far the simplest approach that I've seen to it. It's purely syntactic. Anyone can understand it, even if you don't, even if you've never seen AD in your life. It's literally just apply a bunch of equations. Um, so the the moral of the story, which I hope to have convinced you of it, is that um, the higher order string diagrams and, and and more generally hierarchical graph based representations. Um, are extremely convenient for representing complicated program transformations. They're just very, very convenient for writing those program transform transformations. Um, they free you from having to think about um, the names of things. They free you from having to think about findings and, and sharing because it's all there in the graph. Um, they free you from having to think about the order in which things are executed, uh, because you can load something down the graph as long as you don't, uh, you know, reconnect the wires. So, so on the other hand, I think theoretically they are extremely these representations are extremely nice, extremely convenient. And on the other hand, I I won't really go into this today. Uh, but if you go and try to implement these algorithms, I think you'll find, as, as we have, 
um, that implementing them on these graph-based intermediate representations uh, with explicit sharing of, of, of nodes, I think you'll find that it's so much nicer than any AST to AST based approach that you could have uh, devised. Um, the, the, that's that's the real the real point of this talk isn't so much here's a cool AD algorithm. It's really look at how simple things become when you stop working on terms and start working. Um, and with that, uh, I'll I'll conclude. Um, and um, if if there are any questions, uh, I think now is now is a good time. And if you come up with any questions later, uh, I think my email is available somewhere online, uh, and I'm, I'm always available to, to talk about AD. It's it's basically all I do. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple of questions, and um, maybe I think you probably already answered uh, the second one. So I start with the with the first one. So um, you mentioned that uh, the vision of um, AD uh, is to some extent to replace uh, sort of neural networks in machine learning applications. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, maybe illustrate yeah. that by an example. What what is the sort of machine learning problem you're thinking of, and how 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 that would would work? Um, that is perhaps slightly um, optimistic of me um, to say, uh, but the way machine learning is conducted now is you you assemble your system out of uh, a bunch of layers of neurons in a very um, it's like you, you have, so to speak, it's like you have a, a, a set of Lego pieces and you assemble them together. Um, something that we'd like to see is a different way of going about this where you just write your program. You write any program with any logic that you want. Um, this program has a bunch of parameters that you want to tune. Uh, and, and suddenly, if, if AD is, is able to handle your entire program, suddenly you can, you can tune the parameters in your program by doing gradient descent. Um, and you can, the, the, the vision behind differentiable programming, at least for, for me and for, for our team, is this idea that we can, we can go from from neural networks to to simply writing parameterized programs with arbitrary logic inside of them, um, and having having the learning algorithm simply infer the optimal values for the free parameters in your program, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't think this is a generalized vision in the machine learning community. I don't think mm -hmm. this is something like oh, this is everyone thinks this is how the field is going to evolve. It's simply how our team looks at it. Hmm. Right, but I, okay, I think I get a better idea. So what you're saying is that you're basically generalizing the, the, the sort of reverse inference rule that you have in, in, in neural networks. So, so one particular way of using this would be to basically have your program represent a neural network the, the, the sort of firing rules of the neural network and 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 basically the the, the, the variables would be the neurons presumably um, and then if you do the, the the inverse sort of ad that would represent the the, the learning rule the, the the inference rule in the in the in the neural network but you can apply this also to programs that are not neural networks so basically to programs in general so in that sense it's a general it's not really replacing Neural network is sort of generalizing the principle of neural networks to arbitrary programs. Is that is that a way of phrasing that? Is that correct? Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, something that I should have mentioned, perhaps, uh, reverse node AD is often seen as a generalization of the back propagation algorithm mm -hmm. used in neural networks. Okay. Okay. But the idea behind reverse mode AD is to be able to do back propagation in any kind of program not just a sequential series of layers of, of neural units. Okay, okay, got it. 
All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Nicolas. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for, for a really interesting talk. And uh, uh, I think I wanted to start with just one very technical question about the notation. So if you could maybe go back just to the last diagram you had in the sequence. Because here, like this one, for example. So I do understand that you do have two types of boxes, the orange ones, the greenish ones. The greenish ones always seem to have like you flip the graphical structure on the inside to really connect the wires. But then even then it doesn't fit. And so I think I missed the point at some, if you have a sort of open wire on the inside, does it, that was representing a function, if I remember that correctly? You, you, you did can you repeat the last part of the question? Is, uh, so, so, so here, for example, this bottom uh, bottom right green thing, I flip it and I still see the wires don't match. I have three inputs ah, for, the, for the F with the application. I only have uh, two inputs, even if I flip yeah. the interior side. Yeah, so. Yeah. So, so here we, we have, we, we've often abused the notation with um, making it very clear. Um, and we, we use the same notation for a single wire for a bundle of wires, which causes much confusion. Um, so this wire um, is in fact two wires. Oh, but then it doesn't fit into the upper guy, yes? Because it only clearly is only one wire. Oh well, so so no, it, it fits. It fits. It fits on, on both boxes. So the the orange box will have the same inputs and outputs. So for the orange box, you will have this output wire corresponds to this wire, uh, and then you will have two other output wires corresponding to these two legs of the weakening. Um, so these two just plug in here and here. Actually. Oh. Yeah, but I mean, so, so the only thing I'm asking is that, so is there any reason for that? Why not just simply have a consistent notation for the number of connected components? Um, the, the, there's no good reason. Sorry. Um, the, there's, there's no good reason uh, for not having a consistent notation. The, the, okay. So, so, I mean, it's just that, uh, so, so if I look at some of these diagrams, it's, there's some extra decoding it's, I have to do. It's, it's bad notation. Uh, the anyway, problem is okay. But, okay, let's not spend too much time on this. So, so the, the actual question I had was, so whenever I listen to this talk on any types of string diagrams, of course, always these individual equations, they look quite reasonable. You somehow locally modify the diagram. And you even said it's some sort of, enjoy some sort of confluence property. So then if you show these little movie scripts of transforming such a diagram, it seems that the complexity or at least apparent complexity of the diagram seems to shift, I mean, all over the place. Sometimes you get many more boxes, sometimes less. So how do you actually, I mean, even if it's confident, I mean, you could run forever in sort of forward, backward loops. Is there any sort of way you put a gradient or some sort of cost function on the individual moves your algorithm performs? Or how do you pick the strategy, the sequence of, modifications that eventually, or even to ask what's the fixed point. I mean, how do you decide that your algorithm has manipulated the diagram and can do no more? So, well, so, 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 so these, these rules are not equations, right? They, they, are, they are rewrite rules. Yes, they so, 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 sorry, I meant rewrite rules, yes. In, in your case, it's re actual rewrite rules, yes. Yeah, so, so you start with a graph with some colored boxes and you apply these until there are no more color boxes, uh, and then you're done. Yeah, but I mean, you see, like you seem to keep the, in, in these rules, if I'm not mistaken, you seem to keep the number of boxes con constant, no? Each of the rules transforms a forward box to a forward box or a backward box to a backward uh -huh. box. Except the identity. Okay. Uh, Nicholas? Right, so, so in, in the end of the day, you, you, you essentially, uh, at random, you pick completely at random any of the rules, test whether you can apply it, and then you go ahead? Well, it, it can't be a random one, uh, because um, it, it, the, the, when you, if you start with a graph, like for example, let's say I start with this one, um, I can't pick any rule because, well, I, I have I mean, to Any of those you can apply in principle, yes? Uh, here, the, the only the only node that is in the fringe of this graph 
use the addition. So, so I need to pick the rule for addition. There are yeah, no... but I mean, I could give you a nasty example where I simply have many fringe nodes, yes, and then you would have to pick. Sure. In that case, you can pick at random, um, and and it doesn't matter. It's it, it you get the same result up to a trivial permutation of the output wires, or so, a, a trivial permutation of the wires okay. that. Mm -hmm. are so maybe Michaela, you had a question. Sorry. Illustrating this, um, because as, as I said, we actually implement this algorithm. I have no idea in which order. We, we don't. We don't, in fact, have a specific order in which we apply these rules. Um, so, we, so I, I think we, I'm asking we, because. Uh, what you're describing is essentially a greedy algorithm. You somehow assume it's confident and you, you do have a natural tendency to decrease the number of those boxes. So you just fire it. If there's choice, you do it at random and then eventually you will, but you don't optimize the actual search strategy. Like for example, in these guys from the World from Physics Project do with uh, these uh, strategy, strategy choices. There's, mm, no, there's, there's not no, the, the only difference that you're going to get from picking a different uh, search strategy is, as I said, a permutation of some wires. Um, so there's no there's no real difference. Um, okay. you, you can't really optimize this. It doesn't affect the results at all. Okay, thank you. I think Michaela was next. Thank okay. you. Uh, uh, Nicola has a question. I, th I think Michaela was next. He was raising his hand. And then and then Gislaine, I think. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, please. yes. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk, uh, Mario. And uh, uh, so I have uh, uh, probably I have the same question uh, as uh, Nicola, and it was uh, or similar. Uh, it is about uh, mm, uh, the complexity of uh, your writing, uh, because I'm aware that uh, uh, an effect free, uh, purely functional. Uh, translation of the backpropagation algorithm might be inefficient uh, in presence of uh, uh, duplication or contraction. So do you know this problem? And uh, is uh, your uh, uh, graph rewriting setting allow you to uh, uh, overcome this issue? Uh, are you, uh, have you proved the, the uh, complexity of uh, your rewriting with respect to the original uh, program? That's that's a very good question. Um, we haven't, uh, in fact, we we have we have performance metrics. Like, like we, we actually have we have actual benchmarks. Um, so we know it's fast enough, uh, but we don't have any actual um, theoretical guarantees. Um, I sus I suspect we only add a linear overhead. Um, but I can't prove it off the top of my head. But did you did you study some of the examples that are known about uh, a kind of exponential exposure of uh, purely functional uh, uh, translation of the back propagation algorithm? Do you did you study mm -hmm. some kind of this kind of examples? No, because well, it, what we have implemented. Um, does an extra pass after this to try and reduce sharing. So, so this is this is the the nice theoretical part. But in our actual implementation, we we, we do some stuff afterwards to, for example, turn some of the um, some of the sharing into into well, optimize the some of the, as much sharing as we can. Basically, um, so. We we don't really care about the performance of this because we do a lot of optimizations afterwards. Okay, because I know, uh, for example, at the categorical Probably. level, that means uh, in some sense that uh, your morphism, your graphs are kind of additive categories, something like that. You commute with sums or something like that. I don't know. I don't know whether you have this kind of equations in your reasoning, in your setting. I'm wondering whether this is the yes. Case. Um, we we push. Uh, I don't remember what the exact rules are right now, but we 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 push things through additions. Uh, for example. Thank you, Mario. Thank you very much. So you, you, as I said, 
you, you, you know that the, 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 the function that you get in the reverse pass is linear. Uh, it, it, like all of the graphs that you get in the reverse pass are linear. So you can do a lot of optimizations by uh, pushing additions through the response. And I have a, a, a second question, more general, but uh, it is about, uh, uh, is your language uh, normalizing? I mean, uh, are you in the setting of simply type lambda calculus or, or in, uh, divergence? For our actual implementation, we, we are actually in, in the setting of a, a real world language that is, it's not strictly normalizing and it's not pure. Um, we don't handle side effects with this algorithm because we cannot, uh, but we do, we do handle recursion. Uh, great. And uh, your, uh, your uh, proof of soundness holds in presence of divergence. We, we haven't, for the proof of soundness, we assume strong normalization, okay. um, but I think it can be extended to settings that are not strictly normalizing. Um, it's, it's just that the, some of the, if we assume strong normalization, then a lot of, most of the proof becomes trivial. Um, but I'm pretty sure you can generalize it to settings uh, with a uh, fixed mode combinator. And we are we are in fact hoping to use a very similar. So so we've we're currently working on a new AD algorithm that can handle um, side effects and control flow, um, and we are planning to produce a proof of soundness for that, which we will which will be based on on the exact same principles as this one. So, so in a way, we will prove that AD commutes with reduction. Um, Thank you. May I ask a very simple question, Mario? Uh, okay. so I, I don't find in my interface the uh, raising uh, the hand to be raised, but uh, this is a problem. Um, because I'm not very familiar with this interface. So the question is very stupid. In general, in uh, string diagrams, uh, you have monodality, but you don't have uh, Cartesianity, right? And uh, operators. In this case, you you do have the axioms of Cartesianity, the, the for the duplicator and the eraser. So the question is: uh, uh, Are string diagrams still uh, the right graphical way to present? Uh, the state of your computation, or can you instead use something like term graphs where you have uh, explicit one single representative for uh, whenever you have a term built with functions and uh, several arguments? You see my point? Mm, I see your point, but I can't really give you a good answer. Um, we, we went for string diagrams because these um, it, 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 it slowly grew out of a more complex project where we actually had um, exponential linear logic. And we were, we were doing this on something that looked like exponential linear logic. Uh, so we were using string diagrams for that. And then we slowly moved into just doing it plainly on the Cartesian um, setting. And we naturally kept the string diagram representation. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks for the. Uh, I had a question. It's the same as as the former question. Uh, uh, it's about uh, the the cost of complexity. If uh, if I I am using I'm, uh, this uh, this model, uh, for, for example, in a machine learning uh, problem. And uh, I had the question how. Uh, if the cost is too high, uh, can we uh, find some uh, measures to uh, distance measures to, to lower the cost of uh, uh, the, the, the program? Thank you. Um, yeah, so 
So it, it, in in fact, it, this 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 approach turns out to be quite efficient because um, I've I've only I've only described the sort of term level uh, or graph level rewriting. But after we finish, um, as I said, we have this forward and this reverse pass, and the reverse pass gets compiled into GPU. Um, so. In practice, this ends up the, the 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 green box. It doesn't stay as a graph. It ends up well. It's not exactly true. It it gets compiled into code that builds um, a computation graph um, at the runtime and dispatches it to a um, purpose built um, ML accelerator chip. Um, so that in fact the backend the backend for this is is um, uh, it's not quite a GPU it's a it, 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 it's an ML accelerator that we're developing with some other teams developing so it it turns out to be really really fast once you lower it down to to that setting okay. Right, so um, I think uh, we could finish the official part of the seminar here and go offline and take all the other questions in a sort of more uh, casual discussion um, afterwards. So no one needs to leave, but we stop the, 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 the YouTube channel now. So thank you very much again for your presentation, Mario, and everyone else for attending and, and, and asking intelligent questions. Um, and uh, we see each other again in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mario. And uh, just quickly to say to everybody who might be still on the YouTube stream, you can join us on the Zoom meeting. We will stay online on Zoom for, let's say, another half hour, I guess. And everybody who still wants to ask questions, please do stay online. I'm just going to stop the live stream.